The steaming volcanoes of the Katmai National Monument of Alaska mark the focal point of study for U.S. astronauts in this phase of their geological training in preparation for lunar exploration. The Valley of 10,000 Smokes, covered by a great outpouring of volcanic ash over half a century ago, is the site of one of the classic examples of recent ash flow deposits in the world. The relatively fresh, barren surface of the valley floor may well be analogous to Maria surfaces of the moon and presents many scientific problems similar to those the astronauts might encounter in their exploration of the lunar surface. Volcanoes of the Aleutian Range, part of the Alaska Peninsula, rise steeply from bays of the Shelikov Strait to altitudes of over 7,000 feet. The area of primary interest to this astronaut field trip included Mount Katmai, Trident Volcano, Nova Rupta, Mount Magik, and the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Oldest rock in the general area of interest include undifferentiated granitic rocks of lower and middle Jurassic age exposed in the northwestern portion of the monument. A belt of these intrusive rocks, 3 to 20 miles wide, trends northeast and is separated from Naknek formation by a major fault. The Naknek formation of upper Jurassic age consists of a great thickness of arcos and conglomerate with interbedded sandstone, siltstone, and shale. It crops out as a mountainous belt 20 to 40 miles wide, trending northeastward across the entire monument. Upper Cretaceous rocks of the Kaguyak Formation, consisting of interbedded siltstone, sandstone, and shale, overlie the Naknek Formation in a few localities in the northeastern part of the monument. Overlying these Jurassic rocks, tertiary and quaternary volcanic rocks of basalt, andesite, and rhyodacite are shown along the chain of volcanoes from Mount Katmai southwestward to Mount Martin. Northeast and east of Mount Katmai, the igneous rocks are undifferentiated on the map. Alluvial and glacial surficial deposits locally containing ash and pumice occur along major drainages including the Savanoski River flowing westward into the Iliuk Arm and the Katmai River flowing southward into Katmai Bay and the Pacific Ocean. Glacial moraines enclose Lake Brooks, Iliuk Arm, and Naknek Lake. River Lethe and Knife Creek, tributaries of the Iliuk River, flow north cutting deep gorges in the ash deposits of the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Mount Katmai, containing a crater lake about two miles in diameter, is the predominant landmark in the area. In 1912, this volcano erupted explosively, showering great quantities of pumice and ash as far as Kodiak Island, 100 miles away, where the ash was one foot deep. Fumaroles and boiling yellow-green water in a crater of Mount Magik are evidence of its recent activity. Andesite flows from this volcano occur just south of Katmai Pass. Trident volcano erupted viscous, blocky lava as recently as 1953. The flow, still steaming in 1966, consists of dacite. Reddish coloration is due to surface oxidation during cooling of the flow. Yellow and white sublimates locally coat fracture surfaces. Although there was no dome in the Trident Crater in July 1965, a small dome or plug subsequently appeared in the crater and was observed in August 1966. The surface of the ground near the trident lava flow is covered with heterogeneous pyroclastic materials, probably representing more than one pyroclastic eruption. Dacitic pumice, probably from a late trident eruption, predominates. In the summer of 1912, prior to the eruption of Mount Katmai, a great flow of hot ash erupted from vents near the Katmai Pass and flowed for 15 miles over a valley carpeted with grass and trees. 
Near the toe of the flow, the ash flowed through low places in glacial moraine. Now a desolate plain of ash in places five miles wide covers the valley. The present surface of the ash flow has gentle relief except where cut by deep narrow gorges of Knife Creek and River Lethe. This ash flow ranges in thickness from a few feet at the margins to a maximum of possibly 700 feet and probably at a volume approaching two cubic miles. Ash flow deposits in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes are characterized by complete lack of sorting and range in particle size from very fine shards to pumice blocks more than one foot in diameter. Perhaps 75% of the rock is composed of very fine ash bedding is generally absent. The ash deposits do not consist of a single massive flow, but consist of a succession of several flows, one following another at short intervals. Each flow unit is generally marked by lateral concentrations of pumice blocks rafted to the surface during emplacement of each flow unit. Although the deposit consists of several flow units, the ash flow covering the valley of 10,000 smokes cooled, for the most part, as a single unit. Most of the accessible portions of the flow are unwelded and loosely consolidated. In the thicker portions of the ash flow, however, the tuff displays a well-developed columnar jointing, indicating slight to moderate welding. This welded tuff is exposed in the lower walls of deep gorges such as this one. The color of the ash flow tuff varies from a pale buff through buckskin brown to various shades of gray. Broad variations in color throughout the deposit are determined by the cooling history of the tuff and reflect the oxidation state of the iron, exalved as iron oxide from the glass upon cooling. Rocks adjacent to fumaroles are altered by the escaping gases. Opaline silica crusts are common around the vents. The ash flow deposit is predominantly rhyolite tuff, although many pumice blocks contain layers of a dark gray and acidic material. Locally, particularly near the base, the ash flow contains abundant dark fragments of basalt, andesite, gray wacky, and shale. At the mouth of a small canyon between Mount Yuli and Knife Peak, the upper part of the ash flow is andesitic and displays columnar jointing. This occurrence indicates that the ash flow deposit may be complex. One other interesting feature that I think might be quite important here is this large mountain on the left. A big scar face Obviously, the whole side is avalanched off. It's a fresh scar. Yet, the pile of debris at the base of the mountain is not great enough to account for that total scar, which suggests to me that the whole side of that mountain caved off before the pyroclastic cone was deposited. That it subsided below the level of the valley floor here and covered with pyroclastics because we don't see any boulders from it strewn down the valley. Several geologists have suggested that the 10,000 smokes ash flow issued from the vicinity of Nova Rupta, and there is some evidence, both geological and topographical, of such a source in the existence of a possible caldera surrounding the crater of Nova Rupta. The existence of a possible caldera rim is indicated by a subdued ridge, concentric to Nova Rupta, that extends across the valley floor from Baked Mountain to Falling Mountain. The outline of the caldera may be traced in this view from Falling Mountain along the subdued ridge across the valley floor to Baked Mountain, along the south faces of Baked Mountain and Broken Mountain, continuing along a ridge connecting Broken Mountain and Falling Mountain, and back along the north face of Falling Mountain itself. A plausible sequence of events would begin with the eruption of the 10,000 smokes ash flow, followed immediately by caldera collapse. Then landsliding on the north face of Falling Mountain took place. 
Debris at the base of the slope was subsequently covered by eruption of Novarupta ash. The volcanic activity centered in the Novarupta area began with the historic ash flows that avalanched down the valley of 10,000 smokes, behaving much like a fluid mass. After they get out into the, now the ash flow is formed and it moves. It moves as a, as, a, as a fluidized system, which is inflated. And I thought we could see this the terrace that I pointed out from up on the pyroclastic cone this morning. That high terrace that surrounds everything up there is the flood line for the sand flow, the ash flow, as it came down the valley. It was inflated that much. The fluidization was maintained by a continuous evolution of gas from the cooling ash flow. At flood stage, the ash flow filled the valley to the level of the high water mark. As the flood crest of the ash flow moved down the valley, the level subsided until the flow came to rest. Further lowering of the surface resulted from deflation of the flow by loss of gases from the fluidized system. There is further compaction due to moderate welding of the tuff in the thicker portions of the deposit. The alignment of fumaroles along the sides of the valley are controlled by fractures that develop during compaction. Originally, the fracture pattern was well delineated by the thousands of fumaroles which issued from cracks in the valley floor. Now, only a very few are emitting small amounts of steam. The fumaroles were formed by entrapped gases escaping from the ash flow as it compacted and from steam generated from surface water percolating down to hotter portions of the flow. The Novarupta dome and associated pumice cone are the youngest eruptive features genetically related to the ash flow tuff in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. The rhyolite dome intrudes the central part of the pumice cone. The pumice cone itself is crudely to moderately well stratified. Beds consist of pumice and foreign fragments ranging in size from less than one inch to several feet in diameter and display poor to moderate sorting. The foreign fragments derived from basement rocks include sandstone and gray wacky. Ridge on which I'm standing is clearly the rim of a pumice cone, a pyroclastic cone, lowest where I am standing and on the opposite side of the volcanic dome is much higher, which suggests that uh, during the eruption of the material, most of it went in the other direction. Inside of the crater rim are steam vents seemingly aligned along fractures or crevices. These fractures form benches inside and look as though they were formed by slumping off the walls of the pyroclastic cone into the crater, probably during the time of emplacement of the volcanic dome. And these cracks apparently go deep enough to control the rising steam from the still hot volcanic dome. The pumice is predominantly rhyolite or rhyodacite, light tan in color. But many pumice fragments are entirely of dark brown andesite or consist of dark brown andesite intermixed with light tan rhyolite. The uh, light colored material is more vesicular than the black colored material, yet it has less uh, phenocris in it. And it's very difficult to pick up any specific uh, felspar, although there does look to be a, a few samples, perhaps of sanadine. There's some uh, dark phenocris which uh, have no cleavage, as far as I can tell, and I would assume they're probably just glassy. And I don't see any real uh, well-defined horn blends or ogites, although there may be some horn blend in here. The uh, dark pumice, on the other hand, has some definite phenocrysts throughout, and uh, they're glassy, light-colored, and apparently sanidine. The last stage of activity at Novarupta has been the formation of the dome. As the gas pressures fall and the temperature drops, 
the melt is not fluid enough to vesiculate and to throw out blocks or break up. Instead, it rises in the conduit as a big sticky mass. Also, as we look over across the rocks, they're pretty well beat up and uh, uh, broken up. Uh, did we, we can see clear evidence of uh, flow banding, uh, which again, uh, uh, we think is a good strong evidence for a, a very sticky, silicious, uh, uh, rhyolitic type uh, uh, lava coming out here. We've already looked at uh, some of the pieces that were of this. Rocks of the dome are dense to pomaceous rhyolite or rhyodacite. They contain abundant phenocris of feldspar, and dense gray portions contain abundant spherulites. The, uh, plug material, it's uh, very blocky. Uh, sizes ranging down from uh, small pebbles up to uh, uh, oh, 10 to 12 or more feet through. Uh, it's all flow banded and very disorganized and, uh, and piled up. Very treacherous going. The occurrence of the two kinds of pumice found together in the ash flow tuff and the Novarupta airfall tuff has not yet been satisfactorily explained. While one explanation postulates two magma chambers supplying material for the eruptions, the other postulates an eruption from a single but complex differentiated magma. The Valley of 10,000 Smokes is one of the classic examples of ash flows erupted in historic times. It more nearly resembles the great ash flows of the past than do any other very recent eruptions. Many significant geologic relations are displayed in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, and some of the later phenomena of the eruption were still active when the valley was first visited by scientists in 1915. Studies in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes have resulted in important advances in our understanding of ancient ash flows and of the eruptive processes that give rise to them. Studies that continue here at Katmai.